Um, so I'm currently doing a postdoc in Memorial University of Newfoundland with Duncan McElroy, but what I'd like to talk to you today is some of the work that I did uh, during my PhD with Nick Butterfield and with Phil Wilby. And the focus of my PhD was to look at the paleobiology of these randomorphs that we've been hearing about. Um, so various aspects of how, what we can say about their ecology, about the communities, and yeah, whatever we can say about these intriguing and enigmatic beasts. Uh, so I'm focused on the successions from Avalonia, so that makes up, uh, use this, that would be, so it makes up modern day um, regions including Charnwood Forest in the UK and South East Newfoundland, which we've heard a lot about from Jack. And back in the Ediacaran, these were situated at around 65 degrees south latitude on a volcanic island arc. And it's this volcanic island arc that was the source of most of the sediment that's making up the successions that we see that uh, Jack, I think, has all convinced us of their deposition environment. And so Rangimorphs we heard about, uh, Charney Masoni, this classic Rangimorph from Frankie. But there's a wide variety of different forms. So you get bush-like forms, you get some on stalks, you get these flat-lying forms, some tree-like forms. And the Rangimorphs, together with the Arboreomorphs, a possibly, possibly not related a group of superficially morphologically similar frondose forms. These, these two groups really dominate the Avalonian successions. There's this wide variety of be beautiful morphologies, but on a, within, within locations and between locations, there's a, a great variety in the composition of the community. So which randomorphs make up the community that we see? And one of the most striking things is that Fractifusis, which is everywhere in Newfoundland, you can't take a step without treading on one, they, they're not present in Charnwood Forest. And so I wondered, well, why, why is this? So looking at modern communities, one factor that's really important for sessile organisms is disturbance. So disturbance can be from predators, it can be chemical, it can be heat, or it can be physical. Um, fortunately, in the Ediacaran, we don't need to worry about predation. And when we don't really have the ability to look for chemical disturbance, for temperature disturbance, we, we don't have the ability to do that. But for sessile communities, physical disturbance, so sediment coming into the system, is really important. It can damage you, it can clog up your um, feeding surfaces, whether you're taking in food particles or absorbing carbon from the water column, the feeding method that's most commonly proposed for randomorphs. Um, and we can group disturbance into two two types. So there's the background kind of everyday disturbance. So the, how windy is it on a daily basis? Are there small fires, obviously, in terrestrial systems? And in marine systems, how much sediment comes into the system settling through the water column? And then we have discrete disturbance events. So these are the major storms, big sediment influx, um, a trawler going through and stripping away a reef, or big forest fires. These are the, the headline events, if you like. And a really nice example of this is provided by the Table Mountain region in South Africa. So in, when you're in the gorges, there's no wind. You get beautiful lush forests, big trees. Whereas it, you're on the top, it's strong winds all day, every day. You only get rushes. So you get taxa that are adapted to different environments. Um, looking at fires, if you get lots of frequent fires, you get uh, small annuals that grow and reach reproductive maturity very quickly where you have um, more sporadic, more temporarily sporadic fires, you get beautiful large proteas, large trees that take a long time to grow to reach reproductive maturity. And so you can look at these life history traits and you can then say something about how well this particular taxon was adapted to coping with disturbance. So generally, in low disturbance regions, the organisms are adapted to, to competition. They want to grow quickly, produce lots of offspring and to do that very quickly. In high disturbance regions, it's more about surviving the disturbance. So you have kind of slower growth, you reach late maturity, and you want to get your propagules as widely dispersed as you can. And a popular theory in modern ecology is this intermediate disturbance hypothesis. So it's like a Goldilocks zone. You get some low disturbance forms, some high disturbance forms. And so we wondered, could we look for some of these traits in in randomorphs, in our ediacarans. The first thing to do really is to quantify this disturbance. And so again, it's just looking at the sediment influx. That's really the, 
it's a really important source of disturbance, and it's really the only one that we can look at in these rocks. So I chose lots of different proxies for looking at the sediment, so how much lateral sediment is coming in, what's its grain size, what's the grain size of the average sediment uh, in the matrix, um, how much is it, how thick is it. And we can also describe the communities using several different metrics. So we can look at the total number of taxa present, the different morph types, so are there stalked ones, flat-lying ones, what proportion of the community do they make up, are there particular taxa that dominate. And we can also look at uh, the different architectures of the fronds, how they correlate with the community. So we can describe a community just in terms of um, how many bushy ones there are, how m the different types of branching. So are they all displayed and tucked in, or are they the more free-form free -form branching? Um, and this really only works for the beautiful large surfaces that Emily showed us some of. It's a way you have lots of tax on the community. So you can say with at least some degree of confidence that we're not just looking at one corner here, that we're not looking, that we are looking at a representative population of the community. And so using a number of different uh, multivariate statistical analyses, which I'm not going to go through now, but if anyone's interested, I'd be happy to talk to you at length about, um, we can show a number of correlations between the community metrics and between the sedimentary variables, so how much sediment influx there is coming in. And so the total number of taxa, you get more taxa, so higher taxonomic diversity, where there's low to intermediate disturbance. You get lots of flat-lying taxa, particularly fractifusus, where there's very low disturbance. And the upright forms generally correlate with higher sedimentary influx. To the one extreme that where you have the highest diversity, um, at least using my characters, you get a community that's dominated by Charnia. So to come at it from the other side, what can we say about the reproductive um, life history traits of the Rangimorphs? And Emily's done a lot of work with this, and I've toyed about with it a little bit. But if we look at the size distributions of the populations, you can see, for example, discrete subpopulations. So this would represent discrete kind of pulsed reproductive events. Or if you have more overlapping forms, then it's a more continuous, uh, a more continuous reproductive stream. So there are a number of different ways of creating multimodal populations, but by far the most common, the most dominant factor is whether the reproduction is pulsed or is continuous. Um, yeah, there we go. And you can see some overlapping cohorts in certain taxa like fractifusus, but then the larger ones for a more discrete population. And this can be where you have sort of blending of the different populations. And to show that we're, or at least to demonstrate that we're looking at something that's consistent, we can look at the same, the population distributions of the same taxa on different bedding planes, and also on one bedding plane, we can look at the populations of different taxa. And one thing that we noticed in <coughs> Charnwood Forest is that the, all of our upright forms, the forms that, that the, the taxa of which there are the largest individuals on the surface, you have a couple of very big ones, and then you have a main population which is quite a lot smaller, and which just seems to have one population. So you have two overall, but a very clear bimodal distribution. And this sort of pattern, as opposed to this one, is very, it's consistent in modern communities with populations that are, are recovering from a discrete disturbance event. So you have a fire that kills most of the trees, there are a couple left, and then they grow very large. But the main population then is much smaller than these two, these few larger individuals. So we looked for some evidence of this, and so this is a section through the, the bed at Charnwood Forest. And so we have our, our siltstone here, our little tuff, our biomat, and most importantly, the disks of the largest individuals are partially covered. They have little areas of this tuff on the disk, whereas none of the smaller ones do. And so we've used that as evidence to show that you have these few large ones. There was a discrete disturbance event. They survived. Their disks are partly covered by this tuff, but all the younger ones that settled afterwards aren't. And so you can put that into a nice little story. So you have an initial cohort that settles on the surface. You have a discrete disturbance event, in this case an ash flow event, that kills most of the population, leaves a couple which grow very large. There's, if competition is important to these things, it's that they can grow larger, there's less competition. If it isn't, which um, some of my colleagues might argue, they just have more time to grow larger. Then a new cohort settles on the surface, either sourced from elsewhere 
all sourced locally, and that's something that the spatial analyses that Emily does would help pick out. And then when the whole community is smothered, you preserve this bimodal population structure, and that's what we can see in the graphs. So we can say something about the life history strategies for the different rangimals. So we have some that seem more adapted to competition. So the flatline and the bushy forms, they have overlapping cohorts showing kind of fairly rapid uh, reproduction, or at least consistent with that. They, they're found preferentially on the surfaces with very low sediment input. And Emily has shown um, that fractifuses reproduce in a stonon-like way. And that's really consistent with an early colonizing form. So these guys over here seem to be more adapted to competition. The forms that are the upright and the stalked forms, which are more commonly found on the surfaces with high disturbance, they have discrete cohorts, so maybe taking longer to reach maturity. Uh, wide dispersal propagules, as Frankie mentioned, Charnia is a really a cosmopolitan taxa. And we've got evidence that they can survive disturbance events. And so taking all of this together, we can come up with some some form of model for how disturbance might influence the community composition that we see and how that might change through time. So this is our starting population up here. So here in our low disturbance region, we have fractifuses, settles on the surface initially. It reproduces rapidly. Where there's very low disturbance, fractifuses is happy as anything. It covers the surfaces. And we see some surfaces that are completely carpeted in these things. Slightly higher disturbance, fractifuses, it's not ideal for it. So it is still doing pretty well, but you get more of these stalked taxa coming in. Higher disturbance again, fractifuses are low-lying forms, aren't so happy. You still have a nice, um, diverse population. And then the highest disturbance really is only Charnia <coughs> that's making it through. If you then impose a disturbance event on this, culling part of the population in modern systems, your new recovery population is most likely to be sourced from the individuals already on the surface. They're already there, so the propagules that they release will settle close by. You may get some coming in from outside, but they're likely to form a smaller part of the recovery community. If you take a nice, thank you, if you take a nice community, diverse community like this, and you kill off everything except the Charnia, then your recovery population is most likely to be biased to that. So you might have started with something like this, but you've ended up with this together. So taking all of this information together, we can come up with some sort of model for how succession might work and how disturbance might influence it. Um, so a few people to thank some uh, collaborators and various funding bodies. And thank you all for listening. <laughs>